Hey, it's a big day here. Um, we are in our Word of the Year series, and it's just, it's always a meaningful thing to me. I always really love getting to preach this, and we do it for three weeks. First week, we kind of talk about the Word of the Year. We reveal it and what it means to us. Second week, we talk about for our families, and the third week is for the community, right? And if you guys didn't get the pattern over the last nine and a half years here, that's, that's what I do, right? So this week is for the community week, and it reminds me of something we completed a few years ago. Any guys remember our Relentless campaign? Um, this was our Word of the Year four years ago. And this year, our word is surround, but four years ago, it was relentless. And relentless was a word that really guided our church. It was um, also the word that helped us build the Hebron building. And Hebron, you guys obviously remember relentless. We never stop is the tagline. And it was a special sermon series we did to talk about the vision that God has for, um, you know, the communities around us. And it was a powerful thing. We ended up raising the funds to build the Hebron building through that series. And it was kind of this incredible inflection point for our church that I'm still blown away by. You know, and, and you might not know this, but we wrapped up the capital campaign to build Hebron, the Relentless campaign, last month. We just wrapped it up. And originally, our goal was to raise $3 million to build the Hebron building. We ended up in total, like after all the pledges and everything else, we just had the last gifts given. We ended up raising $3.18 million from 225 families. And that's just a big, can you believe that God did that? And I, I'm like, God, you're so good. And uh, this is a fun story. So I remember we were gathering the leaders of the Relentless Committee together at my house for dinner. My wife made them dinner. My wife is a great cook. And we're gathering together to have dinner to celebrate the start of construction on the Hebron building. Construction started, yay. And uh, I still remember the month it was in, and you'll know why in a minute. It was like March of 2020. March of 2020. Can anybody ever remember anything that happened in March of 2020? It's just like, hey, we're expanding this building, this physical gathering space that will densely pack people into a small building indoors. This is fantastic. And we're just like, God, you're so good. We're like, you're so good. And literally that night, okay, everybody leaves that night. The NBA cancels the finals, um, you know, all that stuff because the Wuhan virus, the COVID virus was spreading around. And we end up going totally all online. And I knew that God had called us there. But man, I was worried. It's like, what are we doing? And today, four years later, after we introduced Relentless, I know that God was in that word. Like I was this close to stopping the project. Like truly, I was thinking about it. We were talking with leader and I was like, man, I, th I think we need to stop this. Like what are we thinking, whatever else. And uh, we would have stopped it if it wasn't for Relentless. We never stop. If that was not there, that was literally the thing that tipped the scales. I was like, God gave us this word. And looking back, I'm like, God guided us through that. I mean, how cool is that? I can't wait to see what God does for our word this year, which is surround. I mean, I keep thinking like this is every year, every year. I look back, I'm like, man, that was a really great word. It was really powerful. Like God moves and ministers to us through it. And I don't know, I'm excited to see what we're gonna look back on and see how God used this specific word to guide our church. Now, I wanna look back a little bit on the relentless word and I wanna look back on it from the perspective of surround. And what I'm gonna do is preach a part two of a sermon I preached four years ago, which I'm sure all of you are gonna remember, you know, because you do remember the things I preached from four years ago. But this is a continuation, a follow-up. Some of you will actually remember some of the data that I'll present in this message. But the Relentless campaign was built on a verse in Acts chapter one, verse eight, which I'm sure all of you remember, because, you know, of course, you remember my messages so well. Um, but Acts chapter one, verse eight, one of the biggest, most important passages in the Bible says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is a huge, huge passage. And I wanna spend the rest of the message dissecting this passage in reverse. Why? Because exegetically, I think it's gonna show you guys some things that you've never seen before, which is great. You know, really christian -y people love that. Oh, show me something I've never seen before. But even if you're new to God, if you don't believe in God, this is gonna be really interesting to you. This is Jesus's graduation commencement speech, okay? This passage, this verse right here. Jesus is ascending into heaven, and what do you say at graduation commencement? You go back to the basics and you say, you know, live a great life. This is what I want you to do. If you only remember one thing, remember this, right? That's kind of what it is. So Jesus is like, fellas, look, if you only remember one thing, make it this, there's three powerful sections, three powerful parts in this that I want you to see that Jesus focuses on. We'll start at the bottom. He says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
There is a very specific meaning in this. And a lot of you see that and you just think, oh, it's locations, you know, whatever. There's cities, blah, 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 skip it in the Bible. But Jesus is giving us this really important concept here. What he's telling us is start in your own backyard and work your way outward in sort of concentric circles, surround people. And uh, Jerusalem, Judea, or Jerusalem was their hometown. It was like Demot, Wheatfield, and Hebron. That's their hometown, it's their backyard, okay? Judea and Samaria were the suburbs, like Valpo, Crown Point, Cedar Lake, Rensselaer, um, you know, uh, Roselawn, whatever, right? That's your surrounding suburbs. And then the ends of the earth is like distant missions, foreign countries. And I think a failure to understand what Jesus is teaching us in this specific line of Acts chapter one, verse eight, is a big part of the spectacular collapse of the church in America. And here's why. I think a lot of us think it should be 33%, 33%, 33% allocated to each of those specific parts. But that's not it at all. It's an order. It's an order. You start in your backyard and you work your way out. And for us in our budget, the way we allocate our effort and resources is 80% in the Jerusalem, 10% in the surrounding suburbs, and 10% to global missions. That's sort of how we, we do it. And I remember as a kid, I went to a church that did not allocate correctly. It was a wonderful church. I loved it. And we had this thing, some of you who grew up in church, especially if you grew up in a Baptist church like I did, um, remember this. You remember Missions Sunday? If you didn't, that's okay. I'll explain it to you. Missions Sunday was a day where we celebrated the ends of the earth. And we put it up everywhere in our church building, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. That's our big thing, to the ends of the earth. You guys remember Mission Sunday? And our church had a set of all the flags in the world. We'd put up all the world flags. You remember that? In some auditoriums and churches, they had like all the flags, the countries. And then the pastor, sometimes you've seen this on TV, they'll have a picture of a world map behind them because he's got the whole world in his hands. Remember that? Okay. So God has a heart for the nations and uh, he does, he does. And then we would come in and this is totally terrible today, but all the kids would come in dressed as people from different cultures of the flag that they were holding today. That's like cultural appropriation. And oh, how could you? Right. But I actually thought it was a really cool way to learn about other cultures. And then what was the hymn we always sang? We always sang this hymn called, we have a story to tell the nations, which I love that hymn. It, it holds a special place in my heart. And this is super nostalgic for me. A lot of you are like, you don't get it, but I totally understand we would um, have these people called missionaries. And some of you don't know what that means. A missionary is somebody who brings the message of Jesus to a part of the world that doesn't have an indigenous population of Christians. That, that is what a missionary does. And um, we would have missionaries come at least once a month to do a big slideshow of what was happening. And as a kid, slideshows were the absolute berries, okay? I loved slideshows. And here's why, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have pictures. Do you guys remember this? Those of you who are old enough, like before the internet, you didn't have pictures of things, right? So if somebody brought in a slideshow. I mean, if some, remember when somebody would send you a postcard from like a cruise ship and it'd be the only time you'd ever seen a cruise ship. And so you'd save it in like a shoebox of pictures just because it was cool. I mean, a picture, right? The missionaries had hundreds of pictures and the slideshow for us was like an iPad for kids, you know, at a restaurant. It's just like, oh, wow, look at these pictures and whatever. And um, then we had a, what's called a missionary bulletin board. Some of you guys remember this, but imagine a bulletin board with a world map on it. And then you put your missionary families that the church supports around the bulletin board with a string from their picture to the place in the world that they're from. And they'd have like update letters and whatever. And uh, I loved it. Mission Sunday was my favorite Sunday. And the church I went to designated a huge portion of its budget. I don't remember what it was, like 50% of our budget to the ends of the earth. We were a mission church to the ends of the earth. But we really struggled sharing Jesus in our hometown. In the high point of our church, we had less than 100 people that went at the high point of our church. We saw maybe one person every other year who was formerly unchurched to choose to follow Jesus. And the problem was our death rate was outstripping our birth in Christ rate, our, our people finding Jesus rate. So our church was literally dying because we love talking about sending effort and passion and heart overseas. But we failed to create a passion to reach people in our own Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Our demot in Hebron, our own backyard. And it, what's really sad is the church I grew up in, wonderful community, wonderful people, it, it closed, it closed, it, it shut down. Just literally the other day, I was on Zillow and uh, I saw the building for sale, it was a ruin. And it was really heartbreaking because I have so many of my favorite memories in that building, I can still visualize it and it was, it was a ruin. It was a great group of people who loved Jesus, but I think we failed just in a little detail in understanding the order of Jesus's primary instructions. How can we reach the nations if we're not reaching our own backyard? We're called to reach our hometown, surrounding areas, and the nations in the correct order and proportion. I wanna talk about that for a minute in detail. Our Jerusalem is Hebron, Wheatfield, and Demont. That's our backyard. Now, this is me geeking out. 
I'm going to share some specific numbers, and I gathered a lot of this data four years ago. Some of you will remember this. Um, some of you will not. But uh, when I first got here, there were 20 churches in the DeMott Wheatfield area, right? 20 churches. It's a lot of churches. You can see that. They're all marked. And uh, I actually called all of them to get their average attendance. Now, the, the, most of them had a much lower attendance than this, but there was one church that had a much bigger attendance, not ours. There was another one at that time. And the average attendance across all churches in the area was about 120 and what that means is there's about 2,400 people on a good Sunday across all churches in the area that were engaged with the church on any given Sunday. And uh, if you count one-third of the regulars not in church, um, which our church, that would never happen. You guys come to church way more than, than you know, two out of three Sundays. You're way better than that. I know you are. But... Uh, that means 3,140 people were engaged with the church on any given Sunday. In a six-mile radius from the center of our town, that means 19,142 people, um, our total population, which means 16% of our community was engaged in church then and 29% in our present day. Isn't that cool? Like God has changed the percentage. We've moved the needle on people engaged with church. Like in our church alone, we have seen over 100 people choose to follow Jesus in the last year in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And our dream was to radically change this community with the gospel of Jesus. We wanted to see a generational revival in our community, and I really think we're seeing that. I mean, I want you to imagine how much the cultural needle of our communities would change when you see percentages like this, 16% to 29%. That's a real, meaningful change. Let's talk about Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria for a moment, surrounding towns. We believed in 2016 or 2017, 18, that the time had come for us to continue the Great Commission mandate. Jesus says, start in your own backyard and expand outward. Paul did it, the apostles did it. And so we started gaining a heart to put a second location in a community around us. Now, Hebron has a town population of 23,000 in a six mile radius. They have five functioning churches, not including an LDS church and a kingdom hall, which are not Christian churches. And I want you to look at the contrast between Hebron and DeMont Wheatfield. Like that's a big, big difference, you know, similar scale, but big difference. And uh, we actually called the five churches. It was very easy to get the data there, but they had an average attendance of 80, which means on any given Sunday, 400 in worship. I'm just going to be way more generous with them and throw that up to 800 to be safe for people who attend church out of town and are missing and whatever else. What that means is they had about 3.4% engaged with church. And that is kind of an astonishing number. Um, what that means is there's more people that go to church weekly in the country of Egypt than in the city of Hebron in the United States of America. It is among the most underchurched cities in the United States of America by a long shot. I mean, that's truly remarkable. Those are like Portland, Oregon numbers. I mean, truly post-church community. Now, that was four years ago. Today, God has moved in Hebron. And this is kind of interesting. God moved not just in our church's heart, but a couple of churches' hearts. There was a church that opened up. It relaunched a formerly closed church. It's called the Motorcycle Church. And then there was another church um, that revitalized and is now thriving. And we have seen the number jump from 800 to roughly 1,550 that are engaged with church in Hebron every single weekend. And I add for people who are going out of town. And what we've seen is the number go from 3.4% to 6.7%. And that's a huge deal. Like that's a big deal that God did through us. We're changing that region. I'm proud of our church for having a heart to follow God's plan. And I'm proud of the Hebron launch team that went too. I mean, that was a scary thing. It took courage and sacrificial giving and faith to launch that campus in the heart of the pandemic in one of the most de-churched communities in the country. I mean, we expected a de-churched community not to be thrilled that a church was coming. And guess what? Facebook would indicate that they weren't for a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, what the heck? We don't want you. You know, we want a grocery store. Um, but we had a bunch of people who committed not just to attend, but to sit one and serve one too, and to give. And that's a big deal. You know, it's easy just to come and serve. I think there's a lot, I'll just come when I'm scheduled. But they said, no, 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 we don't wanna just serve, we wanna grow spiritually. Because if you just come and serve and then leave, you'll dry up spiritually, right? I would rather that you just come and attend and not serve if you're gonna do one or the other. But really, I'd rather it be both, right? That's what mature Christians do. And the Hebrew launch team, they took that commitment seriously. And we had, I call them the original 100. But to me, they're bold, courageous heroes. Hebron original 100, I'm proud of you guys. And, uh, you know, at the front end, we were a little bit afraid. Believe me, I was, like, super afraid. But looking back, God's been so faithful. I just tell our church all the time. Some of you guys remember four years ago when I said this, but if we want to reach people no one else is reaching, we have to do things no one else is doing, and we have to be willing to go places that no one else is going. I don't want to be a church that just steals people back and forth from other churches and trades members. I want to take new land for Christ and his kingdom. I want us to pioneer. Which brings me to the last part of this first section. It says, to the ends of the earth. 
You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I don't want to minimize or stop addressing the global need for caring for widows and orphans and poverty relief, and especially missions and church planning. That's a huge part of what Christians are called to do. And Christians are majorly responsible for bringing Christianity to the nations because churches have taken this seriously. I mean, it's kind of cool to look at the way Christianity is spread throughout the globe. You know, it's this big movement. It's this important command that Christians have. Christians are responsible for addressing global poverty in the last three decades. We have truly been the impetus behind lifting people out of poverty globally. I mean, Christians are the most generous subgroup of Americans, the highest life satisfaction subgroup of Americans by a long shot. But all while this is happening, the church in America has been languishing. What good is it if we gain the whole world, but we lose our souls? The church has done a great job of sending billions of dollars around the world. And I want to keep doing that. That's part of our mandate. But there's a reason why kids in America are comparatively materially so rich, but psychologically and spiritually so poor. Material things do not address the deep needs and voids of the soul. Jesus does. And you know it. You don't even need to be a Christian to see it. The data on this is real. Jesus is smart here in the order that he makes. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You know, when I first moved here, um, our total church budget, our operating budget in 2014 was $512,000 a year. And we're giving roughly 10% of that budget to missions. And I had a friend, a dear friend, who was really pushing me hard to increase the percentage, increase the percentage. We want to give more to missions. I said, no, I'm not going to increase the percentage, but I promise you, if we focus on doing it God's way, as God grows our budget, so will the numerical value of that 10%. I want to follow what Jesus teaches, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And today that vision has happened. The percentages are still similar, but the dollar amount has nearly quadrupled to more than $200,000 a year beyond our walls that we give to global missions. That's really cool. Because we focused on doing it in God's way with God's proportion, we now give 50% of our 2014 budget. That's cool. That's the way we operate as a church. Now, Jesus knew his movement would not succeed if we were feeding others without feeding and focusing on ourselves too. It's all of it. And that's why we sit a service, serve a service. That's also why we give in proportion. Jesus does not tell us as individuals to give 100% of our income to the church, but he knows that 10% is what is wise. When you go all in with Jesus, we bring 10% of every dollar we earn back to his local church. If we gave 100%, we would starve, but God knows that our faithful 10% over, say, 20 years of following Christ is double what 100% would be in one year. It's a balance. It's a proportion. In the same way that God looks at Christians and his church, and he says, yes, global missions, yes to the ends of the earth, but balance with Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It's a surround, concentric circles surrounding, reaching. That's why we pushed for Judea and Samaria, which was Hebron, because our Jerusalem was thriving. We we were reaching our backyard years ago, and because we followed that plan, guess what? We're still thriving. I'm not saying that we should not give to global missions. I want us to do it all in proportion and in balance to the way that Jesus commissions us to do it. That's the surround. That's the surround. You know, um, part of the reason that we did Hebron too is uh, I believed that we could expand our backyard. We could expand the backyard. We could expand our Jerusalem. And uh, we knew that there were people who needed a life-giving church in their backyard. We wanted to grow it. And it's hard to invite somebody from Valparaiso to come to DeMott for church, but they might drive to Hebron. You know, because here's the thing, and this is a big deal you got to understand. People will drive from rural areas to urban areas. They're willing to do that. But people from urban areas will not drive to rural areas. They will not go to less dense population places. And am I saying that, you know, people from like Valparaiso are, you know, and the answer is yes, I am saying that. Um, (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. We love you guys. Right now, Hebron, you guys are our number one growth focus. We over-allocate to you. We, we are making huge investments in Hebron. Um, Wheatfield is often uh, near full, and that's expected. We are experiencing about two seat turns per weekend. That means every seat in our auditorium full at least twice every weekend. And uh, that's expected. You know, DeMont Wheatfield's 131 years old. But Hebron, while thriving, still has some space. The mission field has way more opportunity. DeMont is roughly 30% engaged with church. And that's awesome. That's great. Like that is relatively nationally 30% of a town population actually going to church, not claiming to be Christian. I mean, Gallup says that number is higher, but the number of people actually in church, 30%, that's great. Hebron's 6.7%. That's good. That's a huge difference. But there's a huge opportunity there. And if you are driving from the north past Hebron to get to Wheatfield, I'd ask you to really consider checking Hebron out. If it's closer to you, it will allow you to surround better. That's part of surround. How can we surround people if they don't live near us? 
Now, Hebron continually scores higher by visitors and evaluators and elders, which sometimes hurts my feelings, but I'm like, it's okay. You know, I love all of our church's children equally, right? It's good. We, we, we uh, went on a staff team building event to play tactical laser tag. It's actually super fun yesterday and or day before yesterday, day before yesterday. We had an awesome time and uh, the campuses were arguing about which one I liked more. And I was like, I like you both equally. You guys are like children crying out loud. Anyway, um, but look, our greatest po- growth potential rests uh, in Hebron. And so I'm asking those of you who are coming from that area to consider investing in that location with your life and ministry, if that's where you're from. If we're gonna take this world seriously, let's go to the campus that is closest to us and pray if you come from a long ways away that doesn't have one near you, pray that we can put a location in your community. We want to expand campuses. We want to add more. It's the most efficient way to do church. And look, the church in America needs more churches. We're watching churches die. I want to start new ones. That's the surround. We're waiting to surround people. And right now, this year, as we think about this word, I want to ask you to join me in prayer, specifically that Hebron would grow to 1,000 people per weekend so that we can multiply out of that building. And I'd ask you to join me in prayer that Wheatfield can grow to 2,000 people per weekend so that we can multiply out of the Wheatfield building. Those are the big prayers that I have. And some of you are like, well, uh, you know, pastor's just concerned about the numbers. I'm not. I just know that every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. God cares about people. He has a whole book in the Bible called Numbers, not because he cares about numbers, because he cares about people. And he knows every single person. Now, um, the next part of this passage says, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. You know, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, this part right here is a little scary. You hear that, and it's like, and you will be my witnesses. And I don't know if any of you get the feeling I get, but I'm like, ah, I will. You know, and it kind of reminds me of this one time when my wife gave birth to our first baby. And uh, some of you are like, where is he going, where is he going with this? Um, I told our midwife, I said, look, um, listen, I like to be in charge and in, in, in control. I want to deliver the kid. I want to catch the kid. Let me do it, please. And uh, this is terrifying because I have no idea what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't go to a single Lamaze class. I did not read a single book. I had never held a small baby in my life, nor had I ever changed a diaper at that point. So it's like, what am I thinking? Why do I want to deliver this baby? But I did. And uh, when Kristen entered labor for real, we had no plan, no plan at all. And uh, I did go to some kind of um, nursing class because my wife wanted me to, which is like, why am I here? Like, I obviously am not going to be able to nurse. Like, there's... I can't, you know, biologically, that's why am I here? So I did not pay attention. Instead, I wrote a paper for seminary. I was in grad school at the time and I totally didn't pay attention. I had like uh, ear pods in and everything else. They weren't ear, they were corded at the time. But the lady comes and she's like, you are being a very unsupportive father. And I was like, I am being supportive. That's why I'm trying to graduate from grad school so I can support my family. Don't tread on me, okay? So anyway, um, when the time actually came, I was terrified and clueless. And when you have an Enneagram type eight who is terrified and clueless, what do we do? We take charge and we start blustering and telling everybody what to do because we don't know what we're doing. Perfect, you know, this is fantastic. So my wife is screaming and crying and I sent a text to the family group text saying, hey, Kristen is having a baby. Now we never told them what we wanted. So they all get that text. They're like, oh, obviously we are gonna go to the hospital for Kristen. So everybody shows up in the delivery room. First person to show up was a relative who was drunk as a skunk, okay? understandably, she didn't have any warning. She was wasted, okay? And um, that's not good. And uh, so she shows up to the delivery room and her phone is getting blown up with text, just blown up. And she did not know how to silence it, partly because she was drunk. And she told me her phone couldn't, didn't have a silence on it. I was like, it does, but you know, I'm not gonna argue with you. Her ringtone was Dixie. I hate that song. I don't like the background of it, but it went off like conservatively 20 times in four minutes. And I was like, you need to leave. So then she started crying, my wife started crying, and right as she's leaving, my family shows up. My mom, my dad, and my brother must have gotten a group rate. They show up to the delivery room. We're here, don't worry, we're here. And I just thought, this is my wife's dream. I'm sure she always wanted her brother-in-law to be there and she delivered a baby, you know what I mean? Like this is, this is going well. And uh, to make a long story longer, um, Kristen gives birth in a real hurry. We didn't know that though, because this was the first baby. And we're basically in labor and assessment. She's like, I got to go to the bathroom. So we go to the bathroom. I'm with her trying to help her. And um, it, it was the baby. Like the baby was there, you know, and, you, and, and, and she looks at me and this was her phrase. I still remember. She looks at me. She says, John, get it. <laughs> and it was at this point that an Enneagram type eight finally realizes maybe I'm in a little over my head. I actually don't know what I'm doing. I'm profoundly unqualified for this situation. And here's the thing. 
For the first time in my life, I usually run into chaos. I want to help with chaos. I want to fix the problem. I wanted to run away. I wanted to let that baby just drop because I was like, yuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe you don't if you've never been there. But that would be cruel and mean. So I got that baby in my literally shaking arms in a ridiculous situation, my wife screaming, I'm screaming for help, the baby was screaming, and I felt very unqualified. But you know what? It wasn't that bad. Truth is, I didn't really have to do that much. I mean, let's think about this. Kristen grew the baby. Kristen pushed the baby out. I don't get what the big deal is. All you ladies say pregnancy is hard. It didn't seem that hard to me, okay? I just stood there, put my arms out, and caught it. I've had Charlie horses, you know? It's just going to be men next week. Listen, <laughs> imagine the level of fear in that whole situation, okay? Like, I actually want you to put yourself in my mindset, my mindset, not my wife's, my mindset. How afraid do you think I was? I was super afraid. And that is the exact feeling I think we get when Jesus says, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. We're all like, ah, ah, I need somebody more qualified. Like, Jesus, I'm not, I don't think you have, I have no idea what I'm doing. Please, Jesus, don't make me do this. And he's like, no, I elected and called this spiritual baby. All you need to do is catch. And we're scared. But why? He's doing the work. The gospel is pregnant in their hearts because of his spirit. He's doing the birthing. It's just up to us, even though we feel unqualified to say, here I am, Lord, use me. I'll do it because I love you, because I love people. I might mess up. There's people watching, but God's got this. I think it would be cruel and mean not to help that spiritual baby find life in Christ, to let that baby drop. And I think there's a lot of churches and people and Christians that do that. And you know what? If you help out in that moment after the fact, you'll be glad that you did. Now, here's the truth. Delivering kids, raising newborns, not pleasant, but worth it. And I would say in a church, it's similar. I mean, being a church that sees people far from God raised to life in Christ for longtime Christians, that's hard, right? Shallow, seeker-sensitive churches that just talk about the gospel but never actually reach people, that's easy to sit back and be like, feed me, feed me, feed me. But to sit there and bring new life, to be a deep church that actually reaches people and transforms life, I mean, that's scary, that's hard. You know, you gotta get in the deep end. This is what people need. I wanna challenge you to be a part of it. Our purpose is to be as witnesses to the ends of the earth. I think so many of us, we run from that responsibility. At the end of the day, I don't think the world has a poverty problem, a racism problem, or a political polarization problem. That's not the problem in the world today. I see a world that has a lack of relationship with God because of sin problem. I think the mantra of people today, and this is big, is um, people don't like the idea of sin. They say, oh, I'm actually a good person. Problem isn't sin. Sin's, sin's not the issue. But um, <laughs> when left to our own devices, uh, when we remove God from society, uh, I think that humans are actually pretty terrible. Like, even if you're not a Christian, even if you're an atheist, it's like, no, like, in aggregate, humans actually, when we pool our wisdom collectively apart from God, bad things happen. Look at every single city in the United States of America that is de-churched. Not good. Like, what's the most de-churched city in America? You, you might not know, but I know the answer because I've looked it up. It's Portland, Oregon, right? I mean, it is a, a, a hellscape. Like, Walmart, and Walgreens are pulling out of the city because we have removed a Judeo-Christian ethic from the city. There are incredible problems. Like they're dealing with doo-doo on the streets. Like it's medieval because sin is a problem. Because sin is a problem. When people find Jesus, we find a purpose. We find a love for others. We're able to love others more than we love ourselves. We find a relationship with God that redeems us. We're able to love others more than we love ourselves because of Jesus. Jesus is the only hope in the world. The church of Jesus is the hope of the world. If you wanna save the world, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. And the process might be scary, but God made you to do it. He made me to be a father and he made Christians to be spiritual mothers and fathers to many. And before I move on to the last part of this message, I wanna challenge you to have a real discussion with your families. Are you reaching people in your backyard? Are you focusing on your community? Are you focusing on the ends of the earth in proportion and according to the order that God has laid out? We talked last week in detail about how to actually do that if you want to learn the process of doing that, look at last week and the week before his message. But I think a bigger question for a lot of us is, do I even have a desire to do it? Our giving, our passions, our hearts as Christians should have a balance for all three. I think there's a lot of church communities that are over-focused on the ends of the earth and under-focused on our own communities. I think there's also the reverse of the problem. 
And I hope that our church is all three of those, in order and in proportion. I would hope that at least all of us, you know, that's a big thing, at least all of us, once in our life would go on a global missions trip. I hope that we would see God's church around the world and say, here I am, Lord, use me. I want to go to the first and the most important part of the verse. This is a big deal, big deal, okay? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power. You know, what's funny is most people who grew up in church, we hear that and we're like, eh. You know what I mean, we've heard that. We see power. Eh, that's cool. Those of you who did not grow up in church, you're like, wait, what? Power? What, what are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about flight? Are we talking about laser vision? I mean, what is the power? This sounds really cool, right? And it is cool. The power that it's talking about is the heart and the desire to be his witnesses everywhere. The evidence of having God's spirit in us is a desire to bring his message to Jerusalem throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the power it's talking about. I mean, that is, that is unnatural. To care about things and people beyond ourselves, that's not normal. Cities without God don't care about people beyond ourselves. But when you have the spirit of God in you, you have a love that is greater than your own immediate life. God gives you the ability to forgive. God gives you the ability to have compassion. I mean, this is a supernatural ability that Christians uniquely have. Almost all other world movements, you don't see it. You see Jesus removed from a society. You see a society that loves itself more than it loves others. You see a society that loves Jesus. And there's this power that Christians have to love others more than they love themselves. To not live in constant offense, but to live in forgiveness. I mean, the mark of a Christian is their love for one another. We're not offended and angry all the time. We're loving, compassionate, and empathetic. If we have no desire or a waning desire to be as witnesses, then we don't have the power because we don't have the spirit or his spirit is diminishing in our hearts. We believe that God actually becomes a part of us when we become Christians through this thing called the Holy Spirit. And you can't be a Christian and have no care about being his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. I think that so often the reason people have no appetite for the things of God is because we're trying to do things without the spirit of God. That's been a part of my life. I'm not gonna lie to you. There are times in my life where from my own flesh, I'm just trying to muscle into the things of God. And here's what I've learned is I can't sustain that without God's spirit. If you have no heart or passion for following the things of God, have you truly given your heart to God? Have you invited him to lead and rule and reign in your life, turning from sin, asking him to forgive your sins and lead your life? Sometimes in my Christian life, I found that my desire to reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth has been waning. It's been waning. I've just found that the Christian life is a discipline of continually inviting God's spirit to reign and rule in my life. And there's a prayer th that I do pretty regularly that I've written down a version of for you guys that might be helpful. And I thought it would be a great way to leave the surround series on all your seats. You, you have this prayer and it says this, God, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. What gives us the power? The Spirit of God. Break my heart for what breaks yours. What breaks God's heart? People who need him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Please give me a passion for building your kingdom and reaching people you want to reach. Wow, this is a dangerous prayer. God loves to answer this prayer. And then I love this last part. Help me surround your people with your love and gospel this week. I just want us to start praying this prayer. Try it for a week. It's a dangerous prayer. God wants to answer this prayer. You know, um, we know that something doesn't come from nothing. We know that intelligent design doesn't come from no intelligence. We know the religion of atheism and secularism are empty. You don't even need to be a Christian to see that. We know it's empty. We know the philosophies of the world apart from God are empty. I mean, you've heard the data, you've heard the statistics. You look at a world map, a national map, you know that God makes a difference. Try the things of God. Even if you're not a Christian, start asking for God's spirit to fill your life. I mean, he is transformative and powerful. As we close, I want to ask you to stand to your feet for a prayer in a minute, but also for the reading of God's word. And I want you to receive this passage, the graduation commencement speech that Jesus gives to his disciples. I bet you can guess what verse I'm going to read. It's Acts chapter one, verse eight, but I really want you to hear this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would fill us with your spirit. Would you break our heart as a church for what breaks your heart? 
please, God, give us a passion for building your kingdom and reaching the people that you've called us to reach. Help us surround your people with your love and gospel this week. Holy Spirit, please fall afresh on us. Ignite our church with a passion for your great kingdom purposes in our lives. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen and amen.